All right. Uh, Joel, Joel neglected to mention uh, oh, at the beginning that uh, if you hear the tornado sirens, <laughs> we go to the basement of this building, which is a little more entertaining in some way. Well, it's more comfortable than the basement over at the Union. Uh, it doesn't have as many interesting nooks and crannies uh, as, as over at the Union. Uh, Sirius has a 20-year history, and along that history, we've had many uh, different organizations who have been in our partner program. Uh, some have left for various administrative reasons. Sometimes it's a uh, changeover of strategic direction. Uh, but we always welcome them back uh, and, and any guys because they're friends, they're supporters, and we're all fighting for the same things. Our next speaker is someone who represented uh, a national agency that was part of our uh, strategic partnership program for a number of years in the early 2000s. So he was a member of the board. Uh, some of the pictures that we were showing the other day, he, he was in one of them at one of the poster competitions, helping to uh, judge some of the posters at that time. Um, and so we thought it was really a good idea to invite Mark back, given uh, his position. Now, I, I wanted to mention here NRO. Uh, how many of you know what the NRO is? Okay, probably about a quarter. So let me just say, uh, there are a number of intelligence agencies uh, that are part of the U.S. government. And the National Reconnaissance Organization is involved in geospatial intelligence. Um, so in that word salad, uh, basically the idea is that if we are going to conduct any kind of uh, intelligence operations or military operations, it's a good idea to know what is, on, what is the landscape, uh, what is the area. Uh, what is there? What has been moved there? What's been moving in the area? Um, and that's effectively uh, one of the missions of the NRO, which is to manage various assets that observe what's going on in the landscape, to analyze it, and to send those results to various agencies and organizations that need that information in a timely fashion. So it's a very vital part of the intelligence community, not well known. Uh, but they have a lot of interesting security problems, particularly in communications. Uh, Mark has been with the NRO for uh, 25 years. He has a career of 37 years in the intelligence agency, uh, first as uh, uh, with the CIA and then eventually getting into this position directing security at NRO. A wealth of experience in a very demanding area. So we thought he could bring some of that information here not only to tell you about some of the challenges, but to project forward with what he sees as some of the interesting problems in the future. So please join me in welcoming uh, somebody who's uh, working on the front lines in a very interesting way and a real friend of Sirius, Mark Spangler. Thank you. Spaff, before you, uh, before you get out of here, I wanted to uh, kind of thank you and I want to give you a, uh, um, a commemorative uh, coin from the NRO, um, if I can find which pocket it's in. Uh, there you go. Um, thank you for the long relationship we've had. And then I wanted to give you an anniversary present, since it's your anniversary. Um, I hope it's not another bottle, bobblehead. <laughs> Anyway, on behalf of the folks at the uh, NRO and our, our cyber warriors um, out there, all the work that you and, and the center does, uh, we appreciate the uh, partnership over the years, and uh, hopefully that will bring you much joy. When it's full. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Spaff. Uh, thank you, Sirius, for the invite this year. Um, I did, uh, I'm going to kind of present kind of a, maybe a lighthearted, maybe sometimes serious look at some of the challenges uh, in today's uh, cyber battle uh, space. And I'm going to try something new, so bear with me. We're going to do an audience participation. So I know how this uh, goes with animal acts, too. Jerry, I'm going to need your, your assistance.
Would you pass these out to four people okay. that you know? That I know? Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, at random? At, uh, well, people you know. All right, Jerry, would you ask them to go ahead and open those right now, all at once? All right, we'll start up here. What, is, what, what was your gift? Uh, you're a zombie. Welcome to this spot. Jerry, what did you do? All right, who's, who's got another one got back here? Oh, we got some bugs in there. But, and what does your, uh, your tab say? Nice. Anybody else? You got some bugs, too? Nice, nice. And lastly? You are most popular in your company right now. Right, nice, nice, nice. So, maybe, yeah. So, um, just kind of a lighthearted example of um, Jerry uh, was used um, to distribute spear phishing uh, attacks for you guys. Um, the problem is, uh, Jerry, why did you do that to these people? Now, question is, why did you open it? Because it was from Jerry, did you trust him? No. No, you didn't trust him. <laughs> but you, but you were inquisitive to see what was in there, right? Um, so a little bit of today's discussion is going to talk about kind of the human condition, because part of our IT system, the large part of it is that biological element sitting in front of the keyboard, um, and we can have all the protections in the world, but if we don't attack that element of the system. Um, we'll continue, as we have for the last couple of years, on users defeating our well-planned um, security architecture because they just have to. They have to open the present. There's, there could be something good in it. And I guess as, if, you under, uh, if you realize that the FBI had to put this on their uh, online fraud page to say, said that you still cannot win the lottery, that you haven't bought a ticket for, okay? <laughs> I don't know why they had to say that, but apparently that still works. Anyway, um, so what about this? Uh, we've heard a lot of discussions about the upcoming cyber war. A lot about um, cyber Pearl Harbor was mentioned about two decades ago by the SecDef, um, and then cyber 9-11, when it, when it comes, um, if you ask Sony, um, if you ask Target, uh, if you ask Equifax, they would probably argue that it's already here. Um, and I know that my folks go to work every day with the war footing that we're in the battle already. Those folks that talk about the upcoming are a little bit late to the game. We're already fighting the war. And so understanding kind of that mindset about being a battle space commander, understanding what your, your battle space looks like is imperative to managing it and surviving. Whether you're doing DOD or whether you're a pharmaceutical company or a tractor company, there are adversaries out there and they came to work today and will get bonuses for getting your data. Uh, and if you don't understand that, then you'll have to move over to the column of victim. So we want to talk a little bit about that and maybe prevent ourselves from uh, and land, landing in the, the, the victim column without a fight. So today, I'm going to go ahead and talk about these six areas. Know your user, 
Um, know your AOR, anybody familiar with that? Area of responsibility, that's our battle space. Um, and how it's changing today, in today's environment. Um, know where your data is, know what type of data it is, where it is, sensitivity of that data. It is now very challenging. So you don't, sometimes you don't even know what country your data is in. Um, with uh, certainly distributed cloud services, hard to tell uh, where your data might be. And then we're going to look at the adversaries, look at uh, who's out there, what their motivations are, and try to put on the hat or the hoodie, uh, because all hackers wear hoodies, right? Um, and then look at some best practices. So I'm going to walk through this story with these two folks, Flo and Joe, name them whoever you want. But we're going to look at those, those biological elements of, of our system. Um, and whether you're the sysadmin or you're just an employee or you're the, the CISO of an organization, you really need to understand who they are. Right? If I have people who live in a cyber battle space where they're on the phone all day with the credit company, trying to get their, their credit back, they're not a asset to my organization that day. That's lost productivity. And so that, I need to be concerned about where those folks live in order to make sure that they're safe. And so some of our education um, has been targeted at not just inside the workplace, but when they leave the workplace, before they um, before they go home and they stop at the gas station or they do a point of sale on the way home, they need to be under, understand some of the adversaries are waiting for them outside the building as well. So we're going to look at the battle space. Anybody recognize this, uh, this battle space? Maybe the history folks in the room? So if you can't articulate to the CISO or the C-suite what's inside and what's outside, what's your responsibility and what's outside your control, then you probably don't have any um, right to be spending corporate money on that. Um, if you can't articulate this, then you need to go back and do your homework. Because we, I, I run into a lot of organizations that are very enamored with uh, fancy tools and they go out and write big checks, um, but they don't know where to put them in their architecture. They don't know where they're best used or even if they need that tool, but the slides and the sales pitch was very good. You need to know where your, um, where your points, an, ag uh, an adversary might um, attack you, uh, much like a, a fire inspector knows where the source of ignition started, you should be able to look at your architecture and notice the top 10 places an adversary would first be encountered, where your IP space meets an adversary's IP space. And we call this intelligence preparation of the battle space. We're going to use a lot of, uh, let's say, war fighting terms, but as I said earlier, we are in this battle and I don't intend to go quietly. So, important here um, to know where your allies are and where your troops are, what their sizes are, what their capabilities are, where your adversary is, so you can deploy countermeasures appropriately. Um, if you're, you have sensors on your network, but they're deployed because the engineering people are in this building and this is where they wanted to put the sensors because it was raining out and they didn't want to go across campus. It would be important to understand that you have a topography of your network and understand where placement of those sensors is important. You could waste a lot of money um, and think you're watching the adversary when you have your sensors in the wrong spot. So I don't know if anybody has, I was, I was giving some folks an example of this um, over the, the course of the, the conference. I, I went into a group and I was excited because the group, one of the elements in the group was a ma mapping branch. 
And I said, well, this is great. I'm finally going to get this SA of our battle space. And so first meeting with them, I sat down. I, I, I kind of gave a, a little bit of a, a history of, of where their branch was. We had funded for two or three years. Um, and I was excited to see their product. So I said, where, where's the map? They said, well, we, we do mapping. I said, yeah, where is the map? I want to see the map. And they referred me to a spreadsheet full of IP addresses. And so I pulled it up, looked at it. I said, I, I can't make any intelligence decisions off of this data in this format. I, it has no context. It lacks um, the kind of the so what. Where are these devices in relationship to the adversary? Where are they rela uh, in relationship to the core parts of my network that, that I don't want anybody to be able to get access to? They gave me a phone book of the county, and I wanted the Rand McNally. And so when we start mapping, we need to understand that just because I run tools like ITPI, Red Seal, some other, other, other tools, doesn't mean you're doing the job. You have to, that gives you raw data. Sort of like Dick would tell you, the, you'll get, you're getting raw data, but you haven't converted it into intelligence yet. Right? So having mapping and understanding your, your battle space is, are two different things. So without this, these are the items that you need to understand through that, that process. You have to understand what your missing essential functions are. For your organization, um, we'll use the one that's, uh, I guess, most popular um, in discussion this week, which was uh, get the beer out. Um, if you're running a, a brewing company, well, um, your mission essential function is get the beer out. And it doesn't really matter if you were under cyber attack, if, um, if you had a flu uh, that took out half of your workers, or if one of your conveyors broke down. At the end of the day, with through all of that storm, if you didn't get the beer out, you aren't achieving your mission essential functions. And so if your organization hasn't sat down and mapped those out, what those core mission essential functions are, that's really kind of a, an elementary first step because I don't know how to deploy countermeasures around uh, kind of a, an amorphous blob unless I have a clear picture of what your mission essential functions are. Because then I can do critical path analysis and identify the systems that support that. I, I need to make sure that when I'm doing that critical path analysis, I expand the aperture, open up enough to understand that if this is a mission critical facility and I turn off the fire uh, alarm, the fire marshal will do my job for me. He will evacuate the building and interrupt your mission essential function. If, I, if you need cooling for your server room and I turn off your chilled water, um, the, 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 the heat alarm will do my job for me. I don't actually have to come into your facility. I don't have to booger with your, I can interrupt your mission essential functions in that way. And so when you look at what your mission critical function or mission essential systems are, you need to understand the extent of dependency on systems that may fall outside of the traditional look um, that we look at for servers and routers. And then part of that is identifying those critical assets that have to happen. Um, if you identify critical path and you've identified that, I, yeah, I only have one server and it is critical to those operations. Does it have redundant power supplies? Does it, does it have a redundant, do I have a failover in case that, that, uh, that inevitable crash does happen? So basically doing some resiliency analysis on that, um, on that critical path. And then you talk, you talk a look about um, the, the critical path and see where in that critical path your adversary would have access. Um, and so you're looking for exposure. Am I, is my cr mission essential function exposed to an adversary where they could um, interrupt 
um, interrupt its execution. And then looking at the battle space, um, you should be able to pull some stats because that's the beauty of IT. We can really um, set the settings to collect any number of things. Um, doing it wisely is an art, uh, not to collect everything um, because collecting everything means you collect nothing. Nobody has enough time to read that um, and you can't make sense. But you have to understand what, criti what, what is critical. So if I had this um, battle space map and I understood that I get 30 hits on that particular interface down on the left corner, but I get none over here, I now understand where the adversary is targeting me. And so I can move resources there to defend against it. Do I have, is it passive monitoring at that point? Is it inline blocking tackling? So I can match my defenses to where, what um, attacks I'm seeing in the network. And then your intel sources. Um, if you're relegated to sitting inside watching lights blink and alarms flash, um, you're, um, you're trying to fight this battle with, um, with one high, uh, hand tied behind your back. The importance is to kind of get out and take that, uh, that strategic look at the battle space and try to get uh, a look at what your adversary is doing in that space. Is your adversary attacking other vendors in your same group? Have you talked to the CISOs or the CISOs at other organizations in your, um, in your same line of business? What are they seeing? Um, are you pulling down the commercial uh, indications of compromise that come off of some of the intel sources? Because there's a plethora of information out there about understanding adversarial tradecraft. And if you don't understand that, it's hard to assemble the right protection strategy for your organization. So let's go on to take a look at more uh, of our, our, our duo here. So what does their battle space look like? Um, everybody probably touched one of those or is touching one of those devices right now. Um, it's an access point, right? So if it's connected to your network, now you have a kind of a distributed way of ingesting um, things into your network. It's also a point where your users are gonna be targeted. And we're gonna talk a little bit more specifically about um, understanding what your personal battle space looks like. Anybody recognize any of the uh, any of the blocks up here. So these are on our today's battle space. Our data is our data's at Target, our data is at Equifax, or maybe not at Equifax, um, in other places. I was telling somebody uh, yesterday when I was a, a victim of this one, right, Blue Cross Blue Shield, they signed me up for credit monitoring. And so I followed the procedures, I called the folks up, and what was the first thing they asked me? They asked me the very data that they had stolen, right, that, that got stolen. And I'm, you know, the little light bulb went off in my head going, so you want me to trust you again with the same data that you had stolen? And it's not just these companies, it's also the credit monitoring companies that have been attacked as well. So kind of a personal decision on whether you're going to use one of these services or not but understand that those large volumes uh, are are really honeypots for an aggressor because where are you going to go to collect millions of profiles you're going to go large companies that have d large data and you need to be aware of that um, as simple as um, the gas pump um, if you're using your corporate card going to disable your small business because you know you uh, impede your your drivers from getting their product to market because their card gets uh, skimmed um, back in let's say historical we had some issues with toll fraud small companies they get whacked from uh, toll fraud and have fifty thousand dollar bill um, last month from the the phone company because they got they got uh, their their phone system taken over they're, the phone company's not particularly sympathetic 
uh, when they said all of your calls went to Venezuela, they said, do you have any, do you have any corporate business with Venezuela? Well, then why did you allow your switch to talk to Venezuela? Um, so same as, same kind of vernacular that we need to use with some of our, our, our corporate system. I don't think anybody up here has um, not been affected because in some of these cases, this, uh, this uh, I think the Equifax one was half the people in the United States. Um, anybody have Yahoo? Any impacted by the Yahoo account? Um, yeah, so uh, that, that was a billion, um, a billion people uh, that, uh, that were affected. So this is, the, this is the battle space we're living in. So it's really a constant flow of these data breaches that are going on. And we have to understand that that's not going to just affect our employees at work, but it's also going to affect their productivity at home. And so part of that is not bringing bad behaviors like opening stuff you get from Jerry with a trust model, but they have to uh, understand what they're getting into and what liability they have when they open that. A lot of companies have gone to spear phishing uh, training. They send out a, a spear phishing uh, test message every, uh, every uh, month. And if uh, an employee clicks on it, they need to go and take some refresher training. Um, I don't know if any of your companies do that, but it, right now, spear phishing is the number one uh, concern that we have for uh, employees circumventing our protections. Um, uh, and so let's look at that battle space a little bit um, more. I'm going to kind of uh, reach back to, uh, you know, last year you heard um, uh, Greg uh, Tuhill talk about Tuhill's law um, about one year, one human year equals 25 years of computer life. Um, so you really have to look at your company and decide, are you flying the right flyer or are you in a Raptor? Um, if your company isn't keeping up, um, then they're probably leaning towards the victim uh, uh, column because those systems get patched and upgraded and most of those are, are critical flaws that the, the manufacturers ha are, are pointing up and, and, uh, and, uh, and patching. And if your folks aren't patching their systems, their targets, right targets, you're not making the adversary work hard for it. And so what we want to do is make it hard, raise their cost, to exploit you so that they go on to somebody else. It's like putting the lights around your house and that you make them go to the neighbor's house. Um, if you keep your patches up, inherently hackers are lazy and they want the, the right fruit um, and they don't want to have to work hard for it. Dedicated uh, resources and a lot of manpower, they're going to get into your network. The vast majority of people are, will go on to somebody else. And then planning. Um, part of this is planning. Um, if you're not planning for a data breach um, or system failure, you're not doing your company any good. Um, you need to white card this at least with the, with the board um, to understand what their responsibilities are, uh, what they would do in, in uh, when it does happen because it's going to be when, it's not going to be if, and the time you want to be scratching your head wondering what the process is is not the time you have a very large breach. You want your legal folks involved and you want to have um, a good understanding of what each of their responsibilities are to ensure that corporately they've provided due diligence and due care for that data. If your company's not keeping their systems patched, they're not watching for the adversary, it's hard to demonstrate at the end of the day when a data breach goes out and loses a bunch of customer data that corporately they've done due diligence and due care. Um, so right now I think the tide is shifted. I saw last week where when Under Armour got, um, got hacked and some data taken, it wasn't, a, it wasn't so much focused on the attack but on Under Armour's response. They responded within like four days of the breach and they had very aggressive action and kind of were commended about um, their response time 
and their, uh, and their ability to recover. And I think as we see uh, this, this concern evolve, we're going to see less concern about well, did a breach happen because most folks are going to have one. And it's going to be on what did your company do responsibly to first prep their, their networks and then also did they do di display due diligence and due care in customer information. All right, let's go on to this one. So identification of those, um, I was surprised last night I talked to a couple companies that I would have guessed would have segmented their networks already. That um, customers don't need to be on the same domain as your secret sauce. Um, I was shocked to, to find out that they weren't. They had just one amorphous blob of a network and they weren't segmented. Um, anecdotally, I, I, uh, I looked at the Sony, um, Sony hack and I had heard that the, the, the decisive decision came very early that from their uh, CISO to sever that business unit. Um, and wants to announce that their company got a contract, right? They immediately become a target so they can see a spike. They can see a spike in attacks right after the public announcement. So your adversary is watching. They're seeing who gets in the federal register um, on federal contracts, but they are watching corporate mergers. He said one of the more nefarious ones is that when his company is going to purchase another small company, they can count on that other small company network being penetrated prior to them taking over and pulling them into their nest. Um, what they found is once the merger is uh, agreed upon, the spending locally on patching and keeping that, that network up to date goes down and they become a larger target for folks that want to get into your corporate network, they'll get a foothold into another network that you will incorporate into yours. So if your company is doing a lot of acquisitions of smaller companies, be very weary of, uh, of how you go about incorporating those folks into your network. If you have a business unit that just will not comply with keeping their standards up, I have seen very effective use of uh, domaining them off from the rest of the company and letting them uh, fend for themselves because you do have a responsibility to the enterprise and if you have one business unit that you just can't get the, the leadership to adhere to some of those core principles of keeping their systems up, you need to make some decisive decisions about not continuing to send them nagging emails. You need to make an, a, an action to prevent the rest of the network from being drawn down to that level. So who's hacking you? So what about attribution? I'm going to talk a little bit about where these attacks are coming from. Um, no, in no particular order, this is just kind of a sample map, but if our ad adversary, if we're going, to, we're going to get attacked from an IP in, say, Finland, um, is that, you know, what if they took out one of our critical infrastructure uh, systems? What if they took out the, the northeast power grid from uh, a DDoS attack originating from Finland? Are we going to war if they take out a weapon system? I mean, that's really a debate right now is how do you respond in kind um, in the kind of the traditional, um, uh, the traditional measured response on a cyber attack really hasn't been um, resolved. And attribution doesn't come immediately. If somebody sent a missile, we could understand where it was launched from. We could understand who built it and we could immediately respond. Um, cyber is a much different animal. And how do we respond in kind? Um, and that's a, that's a dilemma that I think that, that certainly everybody here is going to be involved in 
as we have more and more, um, uh, let's say, assertive uh, uh, attacks. And one that we're going to debate, especially if we see uh, attacks on critical infrastructure, civilian targets, and st things like that, that how do you respond? Joel, got any suggestions? I mean, if you go to a letter, the attack is mm -hmm. Probably both. Um, so in this map, I think uh, what we've seen is that more sophisticated folks you can't really tell where they're coming from because they're using somebody else's um, they're using somebody else's system to do that. That's kind of a smart approach. If you're lazy, then you're going to be probably coming out of this northern region right here um, and uh, attacking directly. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about um, some of those some of those attacks. Um, So what about um, reducing the attack surface? Um, kind of wanted to open up the discussion into what could you do corporately to reduce your attack surface? We had, had a little discussion earlier uh, with a company and they, they reduced, they, they quit doing BYOD. They said, corporately, we made a decision that our, uh, our attack surface had to be smaller in order to manage it. Um, managing those devices is difficult, and it opens your company up. Now, depending on your business and your criticality, um, it's, a, it's a corporate decision on how much risk you want to take. Um, I kind of gave the example. I was, I was monitoring somebody. It was my brother. Uh, worked for a uh, manufacturing company, um, and he was logging into his corporate um, uh, industrial control system um, remotely, uh, and I kind of watched him through that process of logging in. And he w did user ID and password. He pulled out his RSA key fob, put in the, I was like, hmm, okay, well, I thought you made soup um, in that company. And he said, well, we do. Um, and so I watched further and I asked him what the system was doing and it was doing hardware authentication. It wanted to know that this was the, the uh, device that had been issued to him and then it was doing configuration verification that nothing had been modified on the device before it let him in. And then once it was done, knowing that he was who he was supposed to be, that it was a device he was supposed to have, it was still loaded with the, the load that they had loaded it. It patched him. So it brought his patches up to the corporate level before it even made it onto their network. And though, so he went on to show me kind of the very, very high speed production that was going on. And I said, well, that seems very sensitive. Um, why would they allow you to do that remotely? And he said, well, you, you think it looks like the high speed production system. It's, I'm on a proxy looking at the system. It would be foolish to allow anybody remotely to make these changes from outside the company. And I said, wow, that was pretty good. And that was a decade ago, and that was protecting soup. So, you know, it made me feel warm that there are some companies out there that, that, um, that do take corporate or their mission essential functions seriously and put in place mechanisms to protect that. I wish that transferred across uh, many domains uh, that are, let's say, more critical than soup. All right, so let's look specifically at some target uh, opportunities here. Um, how about this guy? Anybody know him? Is he a threat to your network? Is he? I don't know. All right, so if I came in in the morning and somebody said, overnight, we lost a thousand safes of information. It disappeared from the company. We can't find it. That everybody would stop working and we would find that. 
But I would imagine that if in your company you lost one laptop, couldn't find it, the same response isn't there. It's just the laptop. But I think in some cases we think about all of this storage kind of flippantly because it's just become commonplace. And I can probably steal most of your intellectual property off of a pen. And this comes down to kind of this network hygiene, right? Are you managing your devices down to the user level appropriately where you can't get data off of your network easily? This one especially, this will clean out most companies. And if you don't manage, that's a huge liability. Any disgruntled employees in here? Um, I didn't think so. Uh, but corporately, if you have a network that you haven't taken those prote protections against, you are opening your organization up to huge liabilities, both from data going out and special data coming back in. So let's talk a little bit about all that data that's going out. So the data going out, let's talk about data breaches. Um, we've been talking a little bit about it, um, but let's go to this line right here. And last year, according to the, the Poneman uh, study that po produces this every year, this was last year's total, $141 per record. Well, this is, this is fine if you if you just lose one record, but you lose a million customer files with this information, suddenly the cost of doing business that year is going up and, uh, and maybe your bonus is at stake this year because most companies can't take that out of hide. And so you're gonna see a pop-up of, of insurance in the marketplace to protect against breach. I think I talked to somebody over the, the course of the conference that, that said their company does use uh, insurance carrier to kind of transfer uh, to the, the uh, but that cost of insurance is, is certainly uh, gonna have to be incorporated. And if you can prevent this by low cost control of some of that, those um, exfiltration techniques, two factor um, or two person integrity at some of those critical junctures where you have data leaving, um, I was kind of relating that I was, I was carpooling one time with some ladies and they worked at a medical a testing facility and they um, probably didn't understand why I was asking because they worked in billing, but I was asking them about USBs. It was something that came on the radio that, that spurred that conversation and they described their facility as having probably 2,000 people working in it and they said there was only one person in the company that had the authority to remove data from the, from the network with a USB or burner. And they, said, they asked me, well, why would anybody want to do that? Because that's where the, the information's protected. And why would we want to take that protected data and move it somewhere onto a media that's not protected? And so if you looked in your company and how you do your missing essential functions, you really have to understand how much of that um, convenience you're going to uh, prescribe before you've tipped the scale and you're really fighting a losing battle with trying to protect the, the flow of your data off of your network. Anyway, um, it, this is broken down on breaches um, by uh, sector, business sector. So, any mathematicians in the room? Vicki? Um, yeah, so if you add this up and that figure from the last page, you get in the factor of like $23 billion. Um, that's a lot of cost to corporate um, uh, productivity, um, doing cleanup. You don't buy anything for that. That's just sponsoring, um, uh, identity monitoring for clients that you've you've uh, lost their data for press you know working with your attorneys on liability
proving that you did due diligence. Um, so if this is the discussion that you have in your C-suite, this is why you need to be uh, a, a active member of that discussion because this is what will, will buy you some uh, uh, a seat at that table because if you can show the organization that you're not a liability, that you're not just there to spend their money, that you're actually there to save them uh, money in the long run, that that makes you a partner and not you don't become security doesn't become a liability to them or a uh, an added cost. So let's look a little bit at the the breaches of the causes of the breaches. So, these are the hoodies. This is Joe. We talked about Joe. This is him. He's causing these problems. Um, he, system error. So, m through whether it's um, disinterest, um, lack of training, um, if you could take a 28%, almost 30% of the concern away by reinforcing user education, two-person integrity, about preventing those, those losses, this would be a big, big um, win for your organizations. Fees, I'm not sure we're going to do a whole lot about preventing, but I think in the, in the case of remote access to your networks, if you're really looking at those points of exposure, you can, you can drop this one as well. Remember, we're not looking for the perfect because if you go into this with the, the understanding that there will be a breach, and it's just a matter of time, you need to educate your folks on what they're going to do when it does happen. And if you can get them to that point of acknowledgement, the further discussions are that will go much better on let's white card this, let's walk through it a couple times, and then what I found is uh, business unit leaders are very, uh, they're very complimentary a month or two into this process that they know, they hear in the radio, so-and-so got breached this morning and they know, oh, I know exactly what we would do when that happens because it will eventually happen to them. All right, so let's go a little bit deeper on what, what this actually is going to look like on your, on your cell phone. Anybody get this one this morning? Anybody want to get rid of their student loan? I get one of these calls almost every single day. It's a new federal program. It's got to be trustworthy, right? Um, yeah, because only the Fed uh, does, uh, you know, acronyms like DOE and stuff like that. Um, anyway, this sounds really good. Um, schmishing, uh, anybody familiar with that term? Schmishing, phishing, um, SMS, phishing. Um, this is a, an attack surface. Um, any and, um Anybody know what the, the abbreviation for the 419 scam is? It's a quiz. There might be a prize. 419. Anybody? Oh, we got one in the back. What is it? That's right. Let's give him a prize. Yeah. So what he said was it was the Nigerian statute against fraud. Um, and so this uh, nickname, the Nigerian Advanced Fee Scheme, um, they're not really interested. I almost get one of these every single time I list something on Craigslist. I get an immediate response that says, I'm really excited in your item. Um, I would like to purchase it. Um, I, unfortunately, I cannot come to your, your uh, location, and I will have to have a shipper arrange. Um, they're not really interested in your item. They're not really interested in the cost. They're looking for that two or $300 extra that they're going to give you for the inconvenience of working with their shipper. They're looking for that advanced fee part. Um, I like to play with those folks sometimes. Um, I don't know about you guys, but um, it's actually become a sport, uh, spam baiting um, or scam baiting. Um, I had one on the line for about a half an hour um, the other day. Um, he was calling from somewhere probably um, 
Pakistan or India. Um, he was going to get, refund me $199 because I had overpaid the purchase of a service maintenance contract on my laptop. Anybody gotten this one? Yeah, so he, he told me, in order to process this refund, I need you to do this on this, I need you to go to this site. I was like, hmm, this sounds exciting, uh, 200 bucks. So I'm typing away on the keyboard, appearing to sound in the receiver like I'm, I'm doing the, uh, the, the, uh, the link. I said, this thing is not working. And then he, you know, talked me through some other stuff like, well, hit the Windows key. And I said, well, what do you mean by window? Is it the one with the flag on it? I don't understand what you mean. My keyboard doesn't have that. He got very frustrated. But he was obviously using a knowledge base, right? So like a help desk, he had a knowledge base. I could tell he was looking up what operating system I had. I was just making something up. And... Um, he was giving me the prescription it told him to tell me, right? And then it, he it was basically trying to enable remote desktop. Um, after about 30 minutes, you know, I just I got kind of tired, and I told him I had to go, and and I said I I, I don't really appreciate you calling, taking, pe and and he was kind of arrogant. He said, I said he said, well, this is what I do to make a living, and I said, well. Does it work? And he goes, all day long. Yeah, it, it, it's sad that that does, and they do prey on people. My, my own father, uh, he got taken by somebody appearing to be from Google, uh, Gmail, and, uh, and they loaded a crypto um, blocker or locker on him, and he ended up having to go to the Geek Squad to get it cleaned up. But uh, it's unfortunate that... There are a lot of people that are out there being preyed upon. Uh, one of the kind of the more insidious ones is kind of up next. Um, I don't know if this will this audio clip will work. Let's see. Let's see if I can tune up the volume here. All right, well, I'm going to just describe it to you. If anybody, has anybody gotten the IRS call? Oh, okay, good, good. Terrible, right? Um, it, apparently it's worded in such a way that it has some hook words in there that really kind of trigger things within you. And I, so whoever crafted kind of the dialogue, it, and it's in a, um, and the one that I received was in a, a mechanized voice, like a recorded voice. You really couldn't tell that it was a foreign person calling you. But they're talking about, you know, and, they, and apparently they've preyed on thousands of unsuspecting folks that don't want to have any problem with the IRS. And so as long as it keeps working. But these are the same people that work in your building, right? These are the same students and grandparents that you all uh, work with and have. Um, and so they're all part of your workforce and they're part of the people who will be distracted. Um, and I've had, I have employees maybe weekly that click on things they shouldn't, redirects, uh, um, spam. Um, it's just part of that human condition that we need to factor in to our, um, uh, our, our our management on that on the battle space. Oh, which one? Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, and, and a lot of times you can't get them. Uh, they'll they'll hang up before the the recording, but you can't. Uh, I got a, a most of it on on this one. All right, so I have now. Here we go. All right. So let's go a little bit more tactical. Do you have a problem with this in this area, the, the skimmers? Yeah, so I'm not sure how long the, the skimmer items are really cheap. I, I think I looked one up the other day, and I could get the whole setup for like 20 bucks. And it was, I mean, that's pretty good. Um, not that I would ever do that. Uh, 
but the some of the more expensive ones um, our our police in uh, in the northern Virginia area said if you find one like uh, their 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 advice is shake it to basically run up and shake the heck out of it and if it comes off leave immediately um, because they have had some issues where the the adversary would come and try to retrieve their device and and there would be in some ensuing problem so um, but these are tough I mean tough to this one especially um, and this one down here this model looks almost exactly uh, a right so what we've seen in our area is security tape so I guess for a while until the adversary buys some security tape um, th that that's their countermeasure um, so how does this does that concern your company I think we talked a little bit about yeah if you're you're delivering products and your driver gets the the corporate card uh, skimmed it's going to impede their business um, also if I'm on the phone all day um, trying to get mine reset um, it's going to impact my productivity the next one I guess the, the the discussion here is a little bit more of a concern because a lot of these we've been talking about for decades right so here's another quiz question there may be a bug or another treat available so um, what was last year's most used password the high schooler yes number two last year that's it it's one two three four five six yay winner winner here we go Joel. anyway how does that happen right you start asking the critical path the critical path analysis stuff and say why 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 is that how if we're if we're really computer security folks how could we allow that to happen? Who's managing those networks that allow users to enter passwords like that? And apparently, a lot of us work in places that don't, they, they allow users to get away with passwords that way. That's, I mean, that's fundamental. Um, and where we're missing the gap, I don't know. And so that's, a, that's more of a troubling, um, troubling fact. Um, part of this is hygiene too um, we didn't talk a lot about hygiene of networks but what I found is a lot of the stuff even on the DOD scorecard and some of the other scorecarding efforts are talk about just basic network hygiene are you keeping your networks up to date as far as patching are you um, configuring and keeping configuration control of your network devices for instance, if you identify that you've done a really good job of defining your, you know, you're defining your battle space, you have two main areas that your network goes to the, out to the internet for primary and redundant, and you've really interrogated the settings on your firewall, do you lock those configurations so that if any change to those firewalls, immediate alerts in your SOC? Because what I found is, most people aren't doing that they don't use the tools that are available that will identify those critical items in your protection architecture and lock them down because as we saw from that other other um, uh, slide human error so many times I have good intention sysadmin folks get inside and they change something and we've had, you know, we've certainly seen examples of very critical interfaces were bypassed and no one knew about it for significant amounts of time because we're just not instrumenting them as we should. They're not instrumented as critical nodes in our network. And so that goes back to the, the network hygiene. If part of the computer or uh, the CS uh, program here at, uh, at Purdue I don't know if they stress that or not, but once you build it, you gotta maintain it. 
right? You can't just walk away, deliver it to the customer and walk away. There isn't something inherent in the liability that you created something and you need to nurture it um, or it dies. And, uh, and I've, what I've seen is networks where engineering folks will deploy and then walk away. And they, there is no money left for keeping the system up or maintained. And so that's kind of the, the coalition of the willing need to kind of bond together and say, we're not gonna, we're not gonna behave that way anymore because it be, become a liability to our organizations if we don't maintain those systems. All right, so let's look at some of these. Educate your family. Um, your laptop sitting around at home, got a teenager, pops it open to look up something, goes to some site, get your corporate network infected. That never happens. Um, the uh, safeguard your devices, especially when you're traveling. If you're traveling to an area that has a very, let's say, aggressive um, government, that you could probably consider your device um, compromised. So don't take your corporate laptop there, okay? Buy, buy a, a cheap throwaway, and once you're done, throw it away. Um, all this review your statements goes along with kind of the review your logs. You gotta have, if you're, if you're doing logging and auditing of your networks, you have to have knowledgeable people who actually know what they're looking at. Um, the worst part is finding a network where there are logging, they're producing logs, no one's trained to look at them. No one knows what they say. And so the worst thing would be finding something months and months and months old that was a problem. And then this issue of answering the, those social networking calls. I don't know uh, if the phone company or, um, or that industry is gonna police itself, but as you saw from that earlier slide, that was just in one day. All of those out of area calls that I got, those were all in one day. All right, so let's look ahead, see what we got coming up. Data breaches, they're gonna continue. The, uh, my prediction is more of those. It's not gonna be much about if you got breached, but how you acted after the breach. Did, were you prepared? And so if this is kind of the, the foot stomper, convince your folks that it's, it's gonna happen. We just need to have our, our plan in place when it does. Having a very kind of order of battle, this is, what, this is what Bill, Sally, and Tom do on the day that we discover we have a breach. This is who we're gonna call. A lot of companies, let's say they, they get completely inundated and they have a whole business sector that's, um, that's been polluted and they're gonna have to do a hard rebuild. I don't know about you, but that's gonna put mo a stress on most businesses. How are you gonna get four or 500 clients? And if you have to replace servers, routers, and other devices on the network, do you have a acquisition process in place to do that rapidly? I, I read a, a cleanup story about a, uh, a one at the, the Pentagon. It took two weeks to reconstitute the network. And they, considered that a, a, a success. How many business could sustain being off for two weeks? Not many. So be on the alert, you got phishing at work and at home. I don't know as, as, as many times a, or many tools as you put in place, you're always gonna get those uh, spear phishing attacks with payload into somebody's uh, inbox. Um, some tools are better than others. Some are crafted in such a way that they've been able to bypass. Um, you need to understand who the target is at your organization. Um, in spear phishing, anybody heard of whaling? Yeah, so you need to know who the whales are in your organization. Um, we have a list of the most, most targeted people in our organization uh, for spear phishing. And we talk to them and we have security officers talk to them to make sure that they understand they've been a, a target and they will get these messages to, if any do get to their mailboxes before we quarantined them and deleted them, they need to understand that they have a responsibility. They are 
part of the security architecture. Social engineering, it's still my favorite because it always seems to work. Um, if you haven't seen some of the, go to the FBI page and look. It's disturbing and kind of entertaining at the same time. Um, people want to believe stuff like they won, you know, a million dollars or something like that. Um, and inherently you can get them and you can manipulate them if there's a, just a glimmer of hope. And, you know, I read a study one time um, uh, in the past couple weeks about why some of those scams are so blatant, right? Have you noticed that some of the, the, the scams, the, the wording is so blatantly false? You know, the context of the, of the language used is just so outrageous that nobody in their right mind would believe that. And so there's one contention that, that that's why they're crafted that way. They're done that on purpose because they don't want to waste their time on you folks, they want to waste their, they want to uh, cut the, the group down to the most gullible people in the society, right? So that's why they're crafted in such a way to kind of exclude the folks um, taking a first glance at it. Still going to continue because it works. Um, identity theft, certainly up. Your decision, we talked about monitoring. Um, that's it's kind of a personal decision. Voicemail, um, that's kind of the social social engineering. Um, the uh, and some of them are just you can make a living just validating it's a it's a working phone number, right? So you, the mere uh, you picking up the phone gives them a say, okay, that's check, that's an active line and somebody answers it, not a machine, not a Google number, whatever. And so that's a that's a data point. Yep. No. Right. Right. Yeah, in fact, I, I actually seen that on my phone. I get the same first six uh, digits, and they, they call every day, and they still remind me that a federal grant has washed away my student loan. Um, if I'd only click on this email. Skimmers, I'm, I'm kind of on the fence on this because with the advent of the chips, everybody chipped now on their cards or we still got some legacy ones out? Most, most people now have the new chipped cards. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to work and factor into skimming um, because that's, it's, it's, a little, it's up the game a little bit. So I'm sure that some, somebody smart will figure out how to, how to circumvent that. So that's kind of a, I'm on the fence. IOTs. Right now, I think I talked about this a lot. I think we're going to see a little rise in malicious activity, just kind of the proof of concept. Can I, can I mess with this? Because people like to mess with us, right? As you saw in that, there was a clown on there. There's always some clown out there who's going to mess with you. Um, and then privacy, I think uh, you heard yesterday from Michelle, her, her, her old boss. Do you know when that, that quote was, the privacy's gone, get over it? Well, you know when that was? Right, 20 years ago. And it hasn't gotten any better, right? And it, if it was gone then, I don't know where it is now. It's, it's your, 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 uh, you, I think the, certainly it's generational. Um, and um, depending on where you're coming from, uh, it's, it's sort of privacy's in the eye of the beholder. I think as Spath had, had said, it's really dependent on, on what your, you know, your background has been. All right, let's go to
So these are kind of the, the, the kind of the leave behinds that I'd kind of uh, recommend looking at that um, you really do have to understand your users, um, what they're trying to do on your network, where they go. Um, if you're a company that, uh, we'll kind of just foot stomp this, if your company doesn't have any business dealing with, um, well, you just use Venezuela again. Do you have any corporate business in Venezuela? Well, then why would you allow your network to talk to IPs in Venezuela? I mean, it, it's an old concept of geo-blocking, but when we used this a long time ago with toll fraud, it kind of made sense going, yeah, why would, why would our network be talking to IPs in Kazakhstan? Because I have business there and I don't have any business there, right? Um, so if you're, uh, if you're a company that has uh, the luxury of having a fairly uh, defined market, you can do some things to limit your exposure. Um, and understanding your space, you need to make sure that you can articulate that. Um, you really don't have any, any, uh, any right to be spending corporate dollars if you can't articulate the kind of the return on investment you're going to get from it. Um, so if you're going to be seen as kind of cross that line between a security guy who's a, a liability and he's going to cost me money to one that's aiding the, the mission essential function, making sure it, it uh, is protected and can always produce revenue, then you're going to put a different hat on. Um, manage your data when possible. Personally, who knows where your data is, but you ultimately have, a, um, have an understanding of what your tolerance is for where, how much exposure you want. Stay aware of the adversary. You're going to need to keep up on what the adversary is doing, both um, to your employees at home um, and are you being targeted. Um, if, you're, if you do a uh, merger and acquisition, you really need to understand what an adversary sees. It's an opportunity to get into your network. And then we've foot stomped the five a lot. Um, this one is, it's going to happen to you. You better plan for failure. Um, uh, this one is, um, is hard to understand because people seem to live in this denial phase that, no, we're, we're, we're spending enough money, this won't happen to us. It's, it's going to happen. Um, either it's going to be a small scale or it's going to be large scale. But either way, it's going to cost you. Um, and then you got to stay vigilant because, after all, this, this cyber war that we talked about for many decades, we're actually fighting it every day. So welcome to the fight. Um, and uh, that's probably all I have to, to leave you with unless there's any questions. Yes. It does. It does a factor in those as well. Those uh, those a ancillary costs. It's a it's a good study. If you haven't seen it, um, uh, I would recommend taking a look through it because it it does talk about different sectors respond differently to breaches. Um, I think right now, if you're in the financial inst uh, uh, financial sector, data breaches are a lot different animal than they are in say if you're core, uh, Target or or. Uh, or Under Armour, seen a little bit differently by customers. Any other questions? No? I'm going to turn it back to, to Joel. Thank you. <laughs>